Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this, our little series of podcasts from the 2017 Goodwood Revival. And we're recording them at the traditional uh, cricket match on the Thursday before the event, which explains why my guest, Richard Atwood, is dressed as a cricketer. I like the cap, Richard. Well, this cap, uh, there's a new one now, and everybody's got the new one, but I've still got the old one. <laughs> and I spoke to his lordship, I said, should I put the new one on? He says, he says he quite liked the green and white one, so I'm going to keep it on. <laughs> it does mark you out from the rest of the field, I must say. Oh, I, I didn't know <laughs> that. <laughs> um, we've spoken many times before, but um, a, a lot of people are absolutely fascinated by the racing in, in, in your day, you know, because... It, it was dangerous, it was glamorous, which neither of which it is particularly these days. Uh, luckily, it's not dangerous, but it could be a little more glamorous. Um, if, we could, if we could start with your Grand Prix career, um, you're, you're obviously forever associated with BRM, and you're unbelievably back in the BRM this weekend as well. You seem to be, you don't seem to get any older, or whatever happens, it's extraordinary. Um, tell us about the sort of camp that BRM was back in the day? Well, um, well I, I suppose the guy I dealt with mostly was, was Tony Rudd. Um, yeah. And uh, I, was, I suppose I was helped a lot by Raymond Mace, who always wanted British drivers in BRMs, fairly obviously, um, because BRM really were the, the Ferrari of Great Britain, and you know, they made everything, um, even the wheels. So, I mean, uh, yeah. so it was a very British thing, and uh, Raymond was a great patriot. He started with ERA, and then it became BRM. Um, but it was, uh, Formula One's always quite intense. Um, and I was their third driver with uh, Graham Hill and Richie Ginther as main drivers in 64, which um, I was uh, nominated that driver after I won the, um, well, I got there because of winning the Monaco Grand Prix uh, Junior yeah. in 1963. Yeah. And from that, I, I was voted the most promising driver, a bit like the Autosport Award thing, which morphed out of the Greywood Securities. And uh, they, they wanted a third driver just in case, I think. And uh, the only race I did was here at Goodwood, in the uh, Glover Trophy, which was 1964, um, and it was in the old stack pipe car. They didn't trust me with one of the new uh, <laughs> monocoque cars, <laughs> but it was Easter Monday, and Sir Alfred Owen could be there, so uh, he, he was in attendance, and he saw what I did, and we finished fourth, which I think was actually quite a good result, <laughs> and he, he congratulated me, and I said, well, you know, I, I'd like to do something else, you know, and you know more. And uh, he said, oh, yes, we'll find something for you. But he, but he never did. Mm. And uh, both Richie and um, Graham carried out throughout all the races. At the end of that year, um, I felt that I needed to race. So I was prepared to leave BRM. But they, they wanted me to stay. And they arranged for, for um, Reg Parnell Racing, run by Tim Parnell, for their private team, Lotus 25s, to have a works BRM engine in the back yeah. of one of their cars. So that actually meant that Tim didn't have to pay for an engine. And so <laughs> Tim was all for it. Um, BRM thought that I could learn all the circuits and that sort of thing. So it was my initiation into Grand Prix racing, but the car was three years old. And the only race I really made a mark of any sort was Monte Carlo again, which I did get on with very well, and uh, qualified and uh, was sixth on the grid, which I thought was, um, I thought was very good. <laughs> um, uh, in the race, uh, it was an old car, and the rear hub carrier broke on the approach to the gas on the hairpin, and uh, that wiped out the rear brakes. Um, I was. A approaching Bruce McLaren who was just about to turn into the hairpin of the gas went up. and I, I I never spoke to him but afterwards but I, I think he glimpsed something coming up his inside really rapidly <laughs> and he delayed his turn and I shot past his bows and went into the straw bales um, no injury or anything like that but um, I, otherwise I think I would have t-boned uh, Bruce mm. and that would have been uh, not a very nice accident I think so that was the end of that I was halfway through the race so I was lying I think I was six um, so that was the only race I really featured. I, I won a couple of uh, championship points, once at, well, at Monza, one at Mexico, just by dint of finishing, but the car was really too old. And I think, looking back, it might have been a mistake to do that. What, what was it about Monaco for you? Do, I mean, I've, I was, because I, I obviously watched you race at Goodwood a lot, and you're a very neat driver. 
Very, very precise. So it, is that is that that's part of the secret at Monaco? I uh, very, I very much think so because you can't make a mistake there. So um, and I like the precision of that as well. And I, I, I mean, I hate chicanes in general, but the Goodwood chicane has always been there, and I like that chicane. It's 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 quite fast, you yeah, know. Yeah. And to get that right, it's uh, satisfying. Yeah. And uh, it used to be a brick ball, which is not <laughs> yes, now. I um, and I, I. Did some testing for Firestone in the Cooper Maserati some years ago, and I, I actually I used to sh I shaved the wall on the way out quite a few times. Um, I just, yeah, I like precision. Can't tell you why. It's just the way I am. Um, I've always got on well with Monte Carlo. Um, yeah, it happens to be a favourite, I suppose. I can't think of a reason why. Winning the junior race must have been an incredible day for you, though, because, I mean, that, that surely is what everybody really wants to do, isn't it? In, in front of all the team owners. And yes, it's a glamorous place. Um, I loved it anyway, as you know. The year before, I was in a, a Cooper Junior, and the engine was, uh, was played up, so I didn't... But I knew I could do well there. And uh, the junior win was really putting the album on the map. Yeah. Uh, because Peter Arundel was winning all the races in the yeah. Lotus, which was, I think, it was a better car. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, but there are a lot of guys in juniors who went forward. Um, there were a couple of world champions there. I mean, Jim Clark. I'm not talking about Jim Clark, but he yeah. was in juniors yeah. initially, yeah. and John Surtees too. And a lot of good, great drivers came out of juniors. And I think any of the front runners could have gone on to make a, a good career. Um, and it just depended on where the, the coin flipped as to where you were whatever time. And uh, I was very glad to be up there with Arundel and Denny Holm and uh, Frank Garner, people yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, Peter Revson did junior, uh, Jochen Rinth. You know, there's so many names there. If you read through it, it's, yeah. uh, they all came through. A lot of the front runners all came through. Fantastically competitive. I mean, you know, it was... Well, it was the only Formula at the time. There was yeah. no other uh, step to Formula One. So, so really, it was a simplified route. So we didn't have Formula Three. I mean, the Junior morphed into Formula Three um, and Formula Two, um, and then there was still Formula One. So after '63, it did uh, get a little bit like it is now. But there are so many stages now. Lewis Hamilton went through so many stages to yeah. get to Formula One, yeah. um, and that takes time. And of course, that costs a lot of money, and that is the problem money i think it's fair to say at least i hope it's fair to say that your your real huge success came in sports car racing notably with porsche uh yes uh, the the opportunities that came we took and uh really i started in the lola gt with 63 which did not finish the race david hobbs my co-driver we're having gear selection problems he missed a gear go the s he crashed the car i thought that was really uh, a really significant car and i felt very much for eric broadly because that was he was holding a lot of hope for that car and it became the well. gt40 it, it did it morphed into the gt40 the following year and i was a member of that team but I'm, again the car uh, never finished a race. It was the early days of GT40. Um, then I drove for Marinella Concessionaires for a couple of years, which was lovely. But we were always a step, a stage back. Yeah, Ferrari had yeah. uh, work team had three valve, we had two. If they had four valve, we had three. <laughs> if they were on injection, we had coverage. So we were always a step down on them. I think the concessionaires were badly dealt with by Ferrari, but we were there in case all the factory cars broke. Um, so that's, I suppose, they kept us back a bit in case we gave them too much competition. <laughs> what, what, what was Ronnie Hoare like to... to oh, to he was an uh, absolute gent. Um, he paid very good money. He was uh, lovely to be with. Um, you couldn't have wished for a better patron, if you like. Yeah. And I had lovely years with Ronnie. But we were never going to really get there. The, the one success I had was to win, the, again, the Grand Prix support of Silverstone in his LM. Um, but uh, very few other results came because the cars were just a little bit um, away from the factory spec. Um, I then went on to drive, well I drove the 3 litre prototype in 68 which was again a car that didn't finish races but uh, it was really fast, it was a good car. Well, of course it had the DFV engine which was a magic to it. Um, but Len Bailey design was a, was a, it was a good car, yeah. um, slightly aer very aerodynamic and difficult to sort. But uh, I love the car. I like the car because it uh, it had a it had a performance advantage with the DFE. 
Um, after that, I then joined, what did I do in 69? Um, oh, 69, of course, I was with Porsche. Um, I had a choice to go with John Wire or Porsche, and I saw the future in Porsche. So I was with Porsche for the next three years, and uh, it ended up with uh, a first and a second, not in the same year. Yeah. At all. <laughs> yeah, now when, let's just stop there, because winning Le Mans is a huge achievement. It doesn't matter who you are, what car you're in. I mean, it, to win that race is... is I've, I've always felt that Le Mans is uh, for the manufacturer. Um, as a driver, you need a co-driver, so you're doing half of it. And they need everything needs to go right, yeah. and there's so much can go wrong, and there's so many what ifs. I mean, in 1971, I won it. There were about uh, I don't know 14 or 15 cars in front of me, ahead on the grid, and I just realised I thought we'd never have a chance <laughs> with all those cars in front. But so many errors in that race, a lot of rain, and and we won it. But I, you know, so many people will have said that was a race I should have won. So we were really gifted that, and. It's not the same as if you're one on one with one car, you know, in a like Formula One. There's, there's no um, comparison for the for the satisfaction, I think, for the driver. Um, and I still think, you know, it's, it's much more significant for Porsche to have won that year than the drivers who happened to be in it. There were probably, I can't remember, nine, maybe eight or nine, nine one sevens there. Any one of which could have won. Uh, any of the Ferraris could have won, as it turned out, because we only had a four and a half litre engine. So it's a lottery. Le Mans lottery. Was there ever a time, and or would you ever admit to being frightened at Le Mans? Oh, Cause, God, yes. Because, I mean, uh, what, we, watching it in the rain yeah. on the old Mulsanne used to give me the shivers, and that's just... <laughs> well, there is, in the 69, we had an underdeveloped uh, long tail 917, and there's on YouTube, and I haven't seen it, but there's a, an overhead shot of Stommelen, Rolf Stommelen, who was driving the other car, the team, the second team car with Kurt Arons, I think, and I was with Vic Elford. And uh, there's a, an overhead shot of, of uh, Stommelen, who, who would really go for it. And he was going down the straight, and he never lifted his foot on the straight bit. And he was literally going from one yeah. side of the road to the other. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that, that was not intentional. Yeah. He was literally steering the yeah. car back onto the straight yeah. and narrow. And that's how difficult that car was. You know, it was uh, an unsorted car, which uh, the following year was perfect. That's when we got some downforce. Yeah, on the back. Porsche was a fantastic company to drive for though wasn't it because uh, they have they have uh, wonderful resources incredible organization hmm. German efficiency yes um, they uh, recruited 10 drivers they they need that they knew that and in 16 uh, 68 uh, I went to Watkins Glen for a six hour race I was driving with uh, Tetsu Ikazawa in a, a 907 and they were vetting drivers for the following year and I don't quite know what happened to Tetsu but um, I, I was chosen for that and Hushka von Hanstein was a guy who who sourced all these drivers because they're going to they're going to be running five cars I don't I think that's unheard of uh, at, uh, up to that time yeah um, in, like in one, <laughs> yeah in one team and uh, they they said initially they were going to make, make new cars for every race I, in the end they didn't and the first race was a Daytona and they were all brand new cars and there were fiberglass flying around in the car because they'd <laughs> never run they sent them untested and uh, but I also think that F uh, Ferdinand Pirk was the man who drove Ford the 917 yeah. to develop because he knew the 908 would not ultimately be fast enough and he was right so that's why the push was to get the 917 and get some mileage on it to see how they could improve it and it paid off in the end for the last two years of the formula that was the car to have and now we hear they might be coming back into Formula One in 2021 which would be exciting for all of us because Porsche is Porsche you know but I don't know that um, I think I think maybe uh, if they have resources to spend, they could do that. But uh, value-wise, I don't know if that would be such a good thing. Mm. Uh, Formula One is so expensive. Mm. And I th also think that with Formula One, I know it's related to the uh, the future of uh, the, the doing away with the petrol engine, if you like, hybrid and that sort of electric. But I, I think it's more recognised on the sports car side. Yeah. And they've now they're going to Formula E, yeah. which yeah. probably... I think for their development of future products, which they're already doing, um, I, I think that might be more value than Formula One. Uh, and I, I think, I would hope, an awful lot cheaper. 
So I haven't heard of that for a while, I think, but I've always thought that the, the, the VW group, if you like, en masse, uh, should actually leave Formula One alone because they can do other things. But that's my opinion. Sure. Now, you still do uh, tuition days at Silverstone for Porsche, don't you? I do uh, the odd day or two uh, a week. Um, it's, uh, I like to keep in touch and it keeps me sharp, uh, particularly when you have to um, contend with customers who, um, uh, let's say, uh, think they're better than they are. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny how you, you get a driver there and they're going to Silverstone, that's the home of the British Grand Prix, but we're not on their tracks, but it's Silverstone. And we're in a Porsche, which is a fast car, <laughs> and they think they're going to go there for a track day, but it's not, it's to learn about the car. And I think that's a misconception that really needs to be sourced out by, uh, by, by, by Porsche GB, really, to get the message over to the, the customers who come. That it's really to, to learn. If the day should be enjoyable, it should be worthwhile going, and they should learn. And uh, that, that's, why I, that's how I think it should be treated. Also, hopefully it makes them safer on the road because these cars are, I mean, these are very quick cars. Well, they are. Um, they have uh, safety devices which uh, will keep uh, drivers uh, safe as far as possible. Um, and it's very clever stuff. And I do think sometimes uh, these systems are triggered on the road. The driver probably wonders, uh, you, know, you know, what was that? but they, they don't take note of actually that something was happening which they're unaware of. And that's something we try and get over to them as well. So we should always be driving under those, uh, way under those sort of limits. Yes. Right, let's finally, finally come back to the present, if that makes any sense. Um, it intrigues me. Why do you still race, Richard? Uh, I had a, um, I think I had a, uh, a niche in my life, I suppose. And uh, I just love the Goodwood events anyway. And I think if it, if it hadn't been for Goodwood, I probably would have just uh, waned away mm. from uh, racing because I, um, I have half a car, but I don't really, uh, it's a very expensive car, the, the BRM, one half litre part car. And um, uh, I don't know where I would have used it, to be perfectly honest. Um, well, good, good would are the best events, so I, why would I go to anywhere else? But as it happens, this year Porsche are running a 928 car, which is 40 years of 928, and they're running a car just to show goodwill, I suppose, I to expose the car. Um, and it's part of their heritage. Um, it's a very heavy car al alongside uh, fiberglass cars like the Lotus Lands and things like that. Sure. So, But we're going to Spa next weekend, and uh, that's a faster circuit, so we might be able to use some of that pace. Um, and there's a couple of races at Silverstone towards the end of the year when I hope it's going to be really wet because <laughs> the best result we had so far well, it was equaled by another guy it was the third place at Silverstone and it was very wet and uh, we've done a little bit of work with the car since then so maybe we might have a chance in, towards the end of the year. I was, when I watch the revival I often think that that BRM is a, a real old friend of yours isn't it? There's a long, I mean, it's, it's like a member of your family almost. It's, it's well, <laughs> it's um, the car, I, I drove it in period, but not in Grand Prix, it was in the Tasman series. And, that, and that's why I want to replicate the car as a Tasman car, which it was. It's now a Grand Prix car yeah. with a one and a half litre engine. Yeah. But uh, the car is now sorted more than it ever was in, in period. Yeah. And it's a beautifully balanced car. Yeah, yeah. And the gearbox is superb. Yeah. Um, uh, and I love driving it. And there's not a lot of G, you know, because it yeah. slides a lot. Yeah. And I like that. I mean, yeah. uh, all the cars at, at the Goodwood will slide. And uh, I think the spectators appreciate that too. I think you're heading for the longest career ever, actually. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't know. I, don't, I'm not, I have no one to compare with. I just don't know, but I haven't thought of that. Um, but as long as Goodwood uh, and get, give me the invite, uh, I hope I will be able to come and do what, uh, what they do best. So do we. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard Atwood, everybody. A big favourite at Goodwood. And as I said, a record-breaking career, or is it going to be one day, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, we'll be back again, of course, with another of our podcasts from the Goodwood Revival. Meanwhile, bye-bye.